to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. In any discussion in life, it's always important to have the facts and the truth on one side and to make sure that we understand exactly what we're discussing in any situation. Friend, the same is true when it comes to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. In talking to people, sometimes I, I hear some common misconceptions that people think they know about the Lord's church, the church of the Bible, but often those are not true. For example, sometimes I hear people say, I may mention something about the church of Christ or talk to them and they'll say, ah, church of Christ, you're those people who don't believe in having music in your assemblies. Wait a minute, we've got music, we have beautiful music, we have wonderful singing, and singing is music, and so that's a common misconception. Sometimes I'll be talking to people about the Lord's Church, and they'll say, Church of Christ, you're the folks who don't believe in the Old Testament. What? Don't believe in the Old Testament? We believe it's inspired of God. We believe it's from heaven. We absolutely believe it is God's Word. We simply don't believe. We're living under the old law and animal sacrifices. In the Church of Christ, we don't believe that there's anything mystical or magical in the water. 1 Peter 3.21, the Bible says that it's the answer of a good conscience. Yes, baptism's essential. Acts 2.38 says it's for forgiveness of sins. But as we think about these misconceptions, friend, we're so glad that you joined us for our broadcast today. As always, if you'd like to have a copy of this series of lessons on the Church of Christ or any subject, you can visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a, a host of Bible study material on our website that you can access, download for free, listen to on CD or audio, or if you'd like, you can contact us at the information given and we'll be glad to send those to you free of charge. And friend, we encourage you, in your local area, stop by and visit the Church of Christ. The Christians there are friendly people who would love to know more about you, would get to know you better, and even would love to sit down and have a Bible study with you concerning God's truth. And so let's turn our attention to some of the misconceptions or misunderstandings that are often propagated about the Lord's church. Sometimes I hear people say, Church of Christ, those are nothing more than Campbellites. And by that they mean that the Church of Christ was founded during the Restoration Movement by a man named Alexander Campbell. Well, friend, that's just not true not factually correct, nor is it biblically correct. And, and let's not really deal with the historical aspect because history is not our guide. Let's deal with this. Is it the case that in the Bible, 1,500, 1,600 years, more than that even, before Alexander Campbell, the Church of Christ existed? If we can prove that the Church of Christ existed long before Alexander Campbell, then friend, that'll negate the idea that he founded it. Well, we turn our attention to the words of Jesus. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, I will build my church. Whose church? Church of Christ. Well, that's what it was going to be called. Did it actually come into existence? You bet it did. Acts 2, verse 47, The Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. Well, was it called the church of Christ in the Bible? It absolutely was. Romans 16, 16 says, The churches of Christ greet you. Friend, we don't believe. We don't teach. It's just not true that Alexander Campbell, Thomas Campbell, or anybody else, Barton Stone, any of those people, 
started the church of Christ. They couldn't have started it because Jesus already started the Lord's church. Acts 20 verse 28. Jesus purchased the church with His own blood. And so if it had already been purchased, if it had already been founded, if people were already added to it in the first century, and if it was already in the Bible being called the church of Christ. Friend, it's just not true or accurate to say that the Lord's church was founded during the Restoration Movement by Alexander Campbell. We've already noticed in one of our past lessons that Alexander Campbell or any other man could not found the Lord's church. Jesus is the true founder. 1 Corinthians 3.11 says, No other foundation can any man lay except Jesus Christ. And so oftentimes I'll hear people say this, but when we come to the Bible, when we look at Scripture, could not be Alexander Campbell or any other man. And so true Christians, members of the church of Christ, they're not Campbellites. They're not followers of Barton Stone. They're not followers of any man outside of Jesus Christ. Nor is there salvation in any other. For there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And friend, that is the name of Jesus. Acts chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. A second misconception that I often hear about the church is people will say that the Church of Christ is just another denomination. By that they mean that the Lord's Church is one of many man-made denominations that exist today. Like the host that you can find in our religious buffet-style environment today, the Church of Christ is just one that you could choose out of many. Friend, that's just not the case. The Church of Christ is not a denomination. It's not non-denominational. The church is anti-denominational. We are opposed to the very idea of denominations. And for this reason, the Bible says God's people are to be unified. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, Let there be no division among you. Psalm 133, verse 1, the psalmist said, How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. If God desires unity, if Jesus prayed for unity, and if denominationalism at its core is naming after another or division, and friend, the Lord's church surely is not a denomination. That's contrary to plain scriptures and the, the very mission of Jesus to unite all. But more than that, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is not a denomination, not like other denominations, is not a denomination today because it's not man-made. It doesn't carry some man's name or some man's ideology. It was designed in heaven. The Bible says it is the eternal purpose of God. Ephesians 3 verses 10 and 11. It was established by God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, while on earth. Remember Jesus' words? Mark 9 verse 1, Assuredly he said to his disciples, I say to you that there are some standing here today who will not taste death until they see the kingdom present with power. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is not a denomination because it is the one church you read about in the Bible. The Bible says there's just one. The Bible says in Ephesians 4 verse 4 there's one body. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 20, there are many members, yet but one body. That body is the church. And so is the Lord's church on the bu religious buffet that we've got today just another option to choose among denominations? It absolutely is not. It is not a denomination. It's the church that we read about in the New Testament. A third misconception that I often hear about the Lord's church is that some will say, well, the name is Church of Christ. And friend, I hope you'll listen carefully to what we're saying. The Lord's Church carries the descriptive term of Church of Christ, not as a, an official title, but more as a description of ownership to the one who bought it. Do we call ourselves members of the body or Church of Christ? Absolutely, but not as a title, not as a denominational title or anything like that. We're simply called members of the body or church of Christ because that description does several things. First, it shows ownership. 
When we say, according to the scriptures, that we're members of the body or the church of Christ, we're saying that we belong to, we're under the ownership of Jesus Christ. See, Acts 2, verse 36 says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. I, when I become a member of the Lord's church, I'm giving myself to Jesus. My body is not my own. It was bought at a price. Therefore, I must glorify God in my body and my spirit, which are His. I belong to Christ. The church belongs to Christ. My ownership and my allegiance is to Him. When we talk about that descriptive term, Church of Christ, we're talking about those who have submitted themselves to follow Jesus every day. These are followers of Christ. The Bible says in John 8 verse 31, Jesus said, if you continue in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Oh, it's not enough just to say, look up in heaven and say, Lord, Lord. Jesus says, it's not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, that's going to heaven. Those who do the will of my Father. Matthew 7, 21. The, the religious leaders in Jesus' day asked in Luke 6, 46, Jesus asked them, Why are you calling me Lord, Lord, and not doing the things which I say? And so it shows ownership. It shows submission to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. And so the descriptive term. And in the sense, the name is, belongs to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, but we're not using that as an official denominational title at all. It's a descriptive term that shows who we belong to and who exactly we have submitted our lives to. A fourth misconception that I often hear about the Church of Christ, or sometimes for that matter, any religious group, is that the church is the building. And we addressed this some in our first lesson, but we want to notice again that when we talk about the Church of Christ, and let's say somebody sees a sign that says Church of Christ, and automatically we think, well, there's the building, that's the church. Wait a minute, more correctly is the Church of Christ meets here. The building is not the church. Mortar and brick and stones and stained glass and a lectern or a pulpit, that's not what the church is about. Hughes is, no, that's not any of that. The church is the people. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27, the Apostle Paul said to the Christians at Corinth in the church of God, 1 Corinthians 1, verses 1 and 2, you are the body of Christ and members individually one of another. God does not dwell in temples made with hands, Acts 7, verses 48 through 50, but He does dwell in the Christian. He does live and reside in our life through His Word and as we follow the Spirit and the teaching of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Then another misconception that we often hear about the Lord's Church is you can join the church. Wait a minute now. Can I just up and choose one day to join the church? Can you just say, you know, I'd like to be a member of your church and I'd like to come down and join. Well, friend, we don't find those terms in the Bible. It's not as though you can just arbitrarily say, hmm, I think I'll join the church today. Now, in the denominational world, that thought is very prevalent. What about in the Bible? Can you just join the church? Can you get voted in? Is somebody going to look at your character and select you or unselect you for membership? Not the way it works. In the Bible, we, simply, we don't simply join the church. There's a different term. We're added to the church by someone else. I want you to notice in your Bible, Acts chapter 2. I want you to look at this passage. Acts chapter 2 teaches us how we become identified with, how we become a part of the Lord's church. Now you notice Acts 2, Peter preaches about Jesus. Verse 36, as Lord in Christ. That message pricks their heart. Verse 37, the Bible says Peter told them to repent and be baptized for their mission of sins. The Bible then says that those who gladly received His word were baptized. Acts 2 verses 40 through 43. And this is what I want you to notice. Those who heard the word, responded correctly, were baptized. What happened to those people? Look in verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And notice... And the Lord added to the church daily 
those who are being saved. Do we join the church? Not according to the Bible. How do we become a member of the Lord's church? I obey the gospel. And when I obey the gospel, does someone in the church join? Wait a minute now. God, the Lord, adds you to His church when you obey His gospel. Isn't that wonderful news? I don't have to go before some committee. I don't have to give men a letter of referral. I don't have to worry about things in my past life that people may bring up that would keep me from becoming a, a member of the Lord's church. No. When I submit to the will of God, when I obey the gospel, when I become a New Testament Christian, in heaven, God recognizes my obedience and with His divine pen, God writes my name in the book of life and I am added to the Lord's church. Now friend, you talk about refreshing. How refreshing is it to know that God in heaven makes that decision, that it's made simply by obedience to the gospel, that it's not dependent upon any men and their prejudice and bias or preconceived ideas. It's wonderful to know that obedience to the gospel adds me to the church and that no man can select or unselect me to become a member of the Lord's church. And here's another idea, wonderful idea. If God adds me to the church, then wherever I go worldwide, I'm a member, I'm already a member of the Church of Christ. Should I be identified with Christians? Absolutely. But I can't join the church if I go to some different part of the world. I'm already a member of the church. I ought to be identified and work with that congregation, but it's not a matter of joining the church. And then we think about this misconception. Sometimes people will say, well, ah, the church... It's just optional. You, you, you need Christ. Give me Christ, but not the church. I, I want to be a Christian, but I don't want all that doctrine and worship and all that. Friend, the church is not optional, and here's how you can know that. No more than a head is optional to a body can the church be optional in your life and mine. Think about this. Jesus is the head of the church. The Bible teaches that in Ephesians 1, verses 22 and 23. That passage also teaches the church is the body. If Christ is the head and the church is the body, can you be walking around without a body? Can we be walking around decapitated? Can we be walking around bodiless? Of course not. Thus, it's not optional. Friend, the church is not optional because 2 Timothy 1 verse 10 or 2 Timothy 2 10 says, Salvation is in Christ. If Christ and the church are inseparable, just as a head and a body are inseparable, you cannot be saved outside of Christ and His church. The church is not optional because they're the ones who've got their name reserved in heaven. Hebrews 12, verse 28 and 29, the Scripture says to the General Assembly and Church of the Firstborn, whose names are registered or reserved in heaven. Think about it this way. Let's say that you have a reservation at a motel. And you go to that motel, what do you do? You simply say, I've got a reservation. Here's my name. They look it up. Ah, right here you are. Your name's in that book. When I'm added to the Lord's church, I'm added to God's divine record. And friend, if those whose names are reserved in heaven are those who are part of the church of the firstborn, then the church is not optional. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 24. As we have already mentioned, the Scripture teaches that when Christ comes, He will deliver the kingdom to the Father. Now, if the kingdom's the church, and at the return of Christ, He's going to take the kingdom and deliver it to the Father. And friend, I cannot say the church is optional if they're the ones who are going back with Jesus to heaven. It's not optional at all. It's essential and it's very important that I become a member of the Lord's church. Here's another misconception that is often very popular among people. Some will say the church of Christ doesn't believe in the Old Testament. I've heard this on numerous occasions. You're the people who don't believe in the Ten, Co Ten Commandments, the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. You don't believe in it. You don't preach from it. Wait a minute now. We believe in the Old Covenant. Romans 15, 4, the Bible says, things that are written before time are written for our learning that we through patience and the comfort of the Scriptures might find hope. Do we believe the Old Testament is inspired of God? 
Absolutely. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Do we believe it's profitable? Absolutely. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. 2 Timothy 3.16 But do we believe that we are saved and that we worship the way they did under the Old Testament? Absolutely not. Unlike Noah, I don't have to build an ark to be saved. Unlike people who lived under the Mosaic Covenant, I don't have to go out every time I sin and make an animal sacrifice. That's wonderful to know. I don't have to follow that salvation system under the old law, and I don't worship like they did. I don't burn incense. I don't make sacrifices. I don't go to yearly feast. I don't set up booths or tabernacles. That system was written for the Israelites. That system, the Bible says, that Old Testament covenant system has been done away with. Now, let me clearly illustrate that. The Bible says in Hebrews 8, verses 12 and 13, in that He, God says, new covenant. He's made the first obsolete. That which is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Friend, what did God say about the old covenant? It's obsolete. Like a rotary phone, like horses and buggies, like the first computer you ever had. It's not useful for us. It wasn't designed to last forever. God prophesied, Jeremiah 31, verses 31 following, that a new covenant was coming. Jesus completed that covenant, finalized it, and the new covenant was ushered in. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Matthew 5, verses 17 through 20. And so we absolutely believe the Old Testament is from God. My friend, I'm going to be judged by the words of Christ. John 12, verse 48. Here's another misconception I often hear. Sometimes people will say, what I know about the Church of Christ is they don't believe in music in their worship. Now again, that's just not correct, nor is it fair. Do we believe in music? Oh, you wouldn't find any better music than the beautiful voices lifted up in praise of God like in the Lord's church. We sing and make melody in our heart. Ephesians 5 verses 19, Colossians 3 verse 16. Do we believe in music? Sure. But here's what's really meant. You don't believe in mechanical instruments of music. And friend, that's exactly right. And here's why. If the New Testament is our law today, if it's what we've got to follow, we find no command, example, or any kind of teaching in the New Testament that authorizes the use of instruments. Sing, make melody in your heart. Singing to one another, teaching one another, admonishing one another. Colossians 3 verse 16, if anyone's happy, let him sing. James 5 verses 11 through 14. Hebrews 2 9, Romans 15, a host of passages. All we learn in the New Testament is that Christians simply raise their voice in praise to Almighty God. And for many years after the first century, history records that Christians did not use mechanical instruments in their worship. And so we simply want to do what the New Testament teaches. And in the church, we find no use anywhere in the New Testament of mechanical instruments of music in praise to God. And then a final misconception that I often hear people say is that in the Church of Christ, what I know about the Church of Christ is they believe in water salvation. And by that they mean that the water, there's something mystical, magical that the water saves. Friend, listen carefully. Do we believe that there is a mystical, magical potion in the water? Of course not. If it was the water, I'd stay in the water all the time to make sure I never was lost. It's not the water that where the mystical magic... No, that's not it. But do we believe in the Lord's church that baptism is essential to salvation? Do we believe that a person must be immersed in water to be saved? More correctly, the question is, does the New Testament teach that? And friend, there are a host of passages where it clearly does. Listen carefully to these verses. Mark 16, 16, Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Acts 2, verse 38, Peter said, Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. 
Acts 22, 16, Paul was told, Arise and be baptized to wash away your sins. Jesus said in John 3, verse 5, Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Galatians 3, 27, As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And then the clearest of all, 1 Peter 3, 21, Peter said, There is an antitype which does now also save us. Baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The, the comparison is Noah and the ark. Noah built an ark. The water saved them when it lifted that ark and drowned the rest of the world. They were saved by water, the text tells us. And then he says... There's a comparison that saves you as well. Baptism. Not the removal of the filth of flesh. It's not as though you get in the water and you're washing sins off. What is it then? The answer of a good conscience. What's that mean? When God says, baptism saves. When God says, you've got to repent and be baptized. When Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized. When Jesus said, unless man's born of water and the Spirit, he can't enter the kingdom of God. And I answer with a good conscience by obeying that. Regardless of what God could have said, I respond to what God said properly by doing His will. That's the answer of a good conscience. And so do we believe there's mystical, magical properties in the water? It's not holy water. That's not what we're saying. But is baptism essential? It absolutely is. And so, friend, we hope today that you'll consider some of these misconceptions. Go to your Bible, check them out, and if you find these things to be true, friend, we urge you, Become a member of the Church of Christ. Visit the Church of Christ in your area so that you can be a part of God's saved people. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is taking the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we do and say. And unlike many other religious groups, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. To redeem a people he calls his own from every nation. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the gospel of Christ, and to God be the glory, and to God be the glory, and to God be the glory. This is the gospel of Christ.